Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me for another true crime deep dive. This is part two of our Alcatraz series, so if you haven't seen part one yet, I've linked it in the description box. You should watch that first because one always comes before two, even in 2022, where nothing else really adds up. Does it? The first installment of this series got us up to the history of Alcatraz until the 1930s when it was transformed into a federal prison for America's most wanted bad guys and really anyone who got under J. Edgar Hoover's skin. And today we're going to talk about a couple of The Rock's most notorious prisoners, which include names that will go down in history like Scarface and the Birdman, as well as three unknown Southern boys who got no respect from anyone until they pulled off the greatest prison break in American history. And when you hear how they did this, mind blown, man. You're going to be stunned. I was stunned. I'm still stunned and incredibly impressed. But before we dive in, let's have a quick word from the sponsor of today's video, Surfshark VPN. I don't know about you, but I don't like to be tracked or watched. I hate being tracked and I hate being watched unless I'm on YouTube and you guys are watching my videos, and then I love to be watched. Keep doing it all day, please. But I don't like to be tracked or watched when I'm on the internet, and that is why I always use Surfshark VPN on all of my devices. Their utilities are powered by robust security mechanisms, but they're also designed to be simple and intuitive to use, which is very important for someone like me, who, I mean, let's just call it what it is. I'm an idiot when it comes to technology, an absolute clown, a fool. The easier, the better for me. And if I'm able to figure out how to install and use Surfshark VPN, literally anyone can. An infant can. Surfshark VPN is jam-fact with features that go way beyond the basics. Like I said, it's easy to install. It's easy to run. You can enjoy all the freedoms of an open internet safely and anonymously with no device limits. Whether I'm home or even like outside of the house at a coffee shop or a restaurant or something, or if I'm traveling out of the state or out of the country, Surfshark VPN is always with me and it always comes in handy, whether it's for security reasons or entertainment reasons. Surfshark encrypts and protects all your data sent via the internet, including passwords, private messages, videos, photos, credit card information, the works. And it keeps all of this stuff safe from prying eyes. Surfshark also has a strict no logs policy, which means they aren't storing logs of your usage or details like your IP address, browsing history, sessions information, or anything else for that matter. Unlike your internet service provider, who probably does keep track of that stuff because a lot of internet service providers are required to not only log this information, but keep it for years. And in the US, they can legally sell information like this. So you may not have anything to hide, but it's still annoying, right? It's still a huge invasion of privacy. And personally, I don't want someone making any money off of me unless I'm getting a cut. Surfshark even has something called no borders mode, which allows you to get around annoying geo-blocking. You know, Surfshark thinks the internet should be open for everyone, no matter where you live. And if you've ever run into geo-blocking, it's so obnoxious, you click on a YouTube video and it's like, oh, this YouTube video isn't available in your area. And that's basically because they can see your IP and so they block certain content based on certain geographical locations. It doesn't make any sense. It's annoying. When March Madness comes around and the Watch ESPN app does that for a Syracuse game, I'm livid, but not anymore because I just use Surfshark VPN and that gives me the ability to change my IP address so it makes it look like I'm someplace else. And using that ability to change your IP address, you can also unlock and access 15 of the largest Netflix country libraries, including the the U.S. and Japan. Did you know Japan has a bomb Netflix library? I didn't know, but now I do. All you have to do is connect to a server in that country. Easy peasy. Now, for a limited time, you can get 83% off a two-year plan plus three extra months for free. All you have to do is go to surfshark.deals slash Stephanie Harlow. This special offer makes your subscription just $2.21 a month, so you can browse securely on all your devices, unlimited devices, actually, which is another feature that sets Surfshark VPN apart. All your devices, all your family's devices, your kids' tablets, your husband's phone, your mom's computer, everyone's computer. It's amazing. Once again, go to surfshark.deals slash Stephanie Harlow or click the link in the description box to get 83% off a two-year plan and three extra months of Surfshark VPN for free on unlimited devices. Thank you so much to Surfshark for sponsoring today's video and let's dive in. 
So I wanted to start with a quick five-minute history lesson on the federal prison system in the United States. Actually, it's like a 30-second history lesson, uh, just enough to give us some understanding of what Alcatraz was and why it was. So the first three federal prisons in the U.S. were Leavenworth in Kansas, McNeil Island in Washington State, and the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary. When I say federal prisons, I mean, of course, there was state prisons, but there was only a few federal prisons. The penitentiary in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, opened in 1932, and it was followed by the Medical Center for Federal Prisoners in Springfield, Missouri, in 1933. And this was a facility meant for the defective delinquents, a term first used by the early eugenicists. And actually, I will say, it's kind of a weird crossover, but Derek and I are doing the Springfield 3 case on Crime Weekly, and one of the suspects in that case was actually incarcerated in this same federal institution. So it appears to be still operating, at least it was in like the early 2000s. But when Alcatraz became a federal prison in 1934, it was the first maximum security prison. And the year prior, in 1933, the director of the Bureau of Prisons began writing the wardens of the other prisons, asking them to put together a list of their current prisoners who might be described as desperate or difficult enough to be transferred to the rock. And I mean, these wardens had plenty of names to give uh, for Alcatraz because at this time, people were breaking out of these other prisons left and right. At Leavenworth in Kansas in 1931, seven prisoners escaped and actually took the warden with them against his will, of course. He didn't willingly go with them. He, like, was kidnapped. And I want to mention the first warden of Alcatraz really quickly simply because he has a very cool name. And I just want to say it out loud. James Aloysius Johnston, right? What a great name. Aloysius? Get out of here. James Aloysius Johnston, he started life as an orphan at the age of 10 on the cold, hard streets of Brooklyn, New York. And he pulled his life together when he began selling neckties in a department store. He moved to San Francisco. He opened his own menswear store and then naturally transitioned into politics. Naturally, like selling neckties, selling men's clothes, politics. And then through his connections and his newly found uh, notoriety with being a politician, he became the warden at Folsom and San Quentin prisons, where he was known as the Golden Rule Warden. Since that whole rule of silence that we talked about in the first episode of this series, the one that would famously drive inmates insane, This was his invention. Johnston would be the warden at Alcatraz from 1934 to 1938. And on July 1st, 1934, he took charge of 32 military prisoners that still remained at Alcatraz when the military vacated the island. And within just a month or so after that, the first civilian prisoners would begin to arrive from other prisons. Now, I do know that each one of these men who arrived at Alcatraz, who spent time there, they had a life and a story. And you can find information out about a lot of them, but we can't talk about all of them. So I'm going to focus on just a couple of these inmates, and I'm going to start with my favorite, Al Capone, also known as Scarface, who actually grew up in the same cold, hard streets as Warden Aloysius Johnston. I don't even remember his first name. Just he's Aloysius to me. Alphonse Capone was the fourth of nine siblings, and all of his brothers and sisters were born to immigrant parents who had traveled to Brooklyn, New York from Naples, Italy in 1893. Now, Al Capone, Alphonse, he dropped out of school in the sixth grade. Apparently, he attacked a teacher, and you know, from then on, it was all downhill for him. Or uphill, I guess, depending on how you look at it. Al Capone would probably say his life went up and got better after he got into crime. Now, I go in-depth on Capone's childhood and background in my St. Valentine's Day Massacre series, which is only two videos, so it's a pretty easy watch. I'll link it down below. But for the purposes of this video, what you need to know is that by the 1920s, Capone was ruling a criminal empire in Chicago, taking out anyone that got in his way. He was making a lot of money. He was committing a lot of crimes. A lot of people were getting killed around him by his order because of him, maybe sometimes at his own hands. Now, you would think that a man like this, a man like Al Capone, who had so much blood on his hands, he'd probably be in prison for murder or for any 
number of the other damaging crimes he had committed. But the law was having a hard time pinning anything on the larger-than-life gangster because he had a tendency of threatening witnesses and paying off police and public officials. So he actually kind of really skated by for quite a while. So the federal government was like, well, we can't just let him like stroll around out there. We have to get him for something. There has to be something we can prove, something we don't need eyewitnesses to prove. And Capone had a tendency of going around and bragging to everybody about how he just didn't pay taxes. And he was making a lot of money, obviously a lot of it under the table. He's not paying taxes. So the federal government built a tax evasion case against Capone. And in October of 1931, he was found guilty and sentenced to 11 years behind bars. Now, before arriving at Alcatraz, Capone was obviously used to getting his own way in and out of prison. And it was said that his prison cell at Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia was like very luxurious. You know, he had the guards and the warden let him bring in all sorts of stuff like this really nice wooden desk, a Persian rug, a Victrola. He was having like homemade meals. Capone was able to bribe guards to allow him to bring in things like alcohol alcohol, uncensored reading materials, silk underwear, extra time on the tennis courts, unlimited visiting privileges, and this actually allowed him to continue running his criminal empire even from behind bars. But when 35-year-old Al Capone arrived on Alcatraz, it's likely he believed he was going to continue getting whatever he wanted because, you know, this is a man for whom enough is never enough. This is a man who doesn't hear the word no because why would you tell Al Capone to no? know? But now he's at Alcatraz. He's with Warden Aloysius Johnston and Johnston don't mess around. I mean, this is a guy who put these men, these prisoners in cages, and then said on top of that, like, y'all can't talk to each other. You can't talk to each other but for like 10 minutes a day. So yeah, Aloysius, he didn't mess around. And he kind of made it clear to Capone from the get that this isn't going to happen here. Like, this isn't going to be a place that you take advantage of, and I'm not going to be a person you take advantage of. But for the next four and a half years, Al Capone would still try to charm his way into certain privileges, but he failed every time. One of the prisoners who was in Alcatraz with him said something like, uh, you know, Al Capone didn't get any special privileges. He didn't get any special treatment besides the fact that he didn't kind of get, like, pushed around or, like, physically... Uh, kind of harassed by the guards as much as the average prisoner because he was too, like, politically connected and he was too well-known, so they didn't want him to, like, get out and tell people he was getting, like, abused and maybe send, like, some of his guys back to Alcatraz under the cover of darkness take out some of those prison guards, you know what I mean? Normally, an inmate charged with tax evasion who had never attempted to escape from another prison, like Al Capone, would not be sent to Alcatraz. Those were the rules. Remember, they said that the only people who would be sent to Alcatraz were problematic, violent prisoners who they just couldn't hold in any other facilities. These guys just would keep breaking out. So why was Al Capone at Alcatraz? Well, author Jonathan Eag believes that Capone's transfer to the Rock was a government ploy to show off the high-profile inmate to the general public as a way to justify the high costs of operating this island prison. And you do see, because I went through all the newspapers at this time, right in the months leading up to this point of it becoming a federal prison, people are starting to question, like, how much it costs? Why is it so expensive? And when it becomes a federal prison, what happens? Well, we pay for it, right? The people of the United States will pay for this federal penitentiary with their tax dollars. And Alcatraz was literally a money pit. When he was a prisoner at Alcatraz, Capone was given the same menial jobs as everyone else, whether it was sweeping and mopping the floors, cleaning the bathrooms, or doing the wash in the prison laundry. And Al Capone was highly respected by some inmates and passionately hated by others. Fellow prisoner Roy Gardner wrote, quote, Al Capone looms on the horizon of public interest as the most intriguing of all criminals, and to his intimates, he is quite as mysterious and baffling as he is to the public at large. He radiates physical energy. He's six feet of bone and muscle, tips the scale at well over 200 pounds, but contained within itself more of the force of human generosity than has ever been found in any man of his type since Robin Hood. One of the funniest things I ever saw was when Capone assumed a condescending attitude towards Warden Johnston. At first, 
The warden registered amazement and then developed into a slow burn, like Edgar Kennedy in moving pictures. Ordinarily, the warden's voice is soft and pleasant, but when he tried to answer Capone, his voice sounded like a cackle from a parched throat. Capone's vanity and arrogance is the principal reason why he is the most hated man on Alcatraz, and his enemies spend much time and thought on planning a no-rap way to kill him, end quote. No rap means, like, they're not going to get caught. Like, they can take Capone out, but nobody's going to find out. They're not going to get extra time added onto their sentence. There's not going to be any sort of consequences for doing that. Now, according to many letters that inmates at Alcatraz sent to their friends and family, Capone did arrive with a chip on his shoulder, but he soon realized that he was just one of many. And reportedly, Alcatraz did that to you. It had a sort of humbling effect on those who arrived with, you know, a big ego already, um, who maybe had a very high self-esteem, a high self-image. They were humbled by being at Alcatraz. And for those who arrived already plagued by self-doubt and low self-confidence, Alcatraz had a shattering effect, like it broke these people. During his time on The Rock, Capone read a lot of books from the prison's library of 15,000 titles. He read books about gardening. He read books about music and music theory. He read self-help books, specifically a book written by a popular inspirational speaker at the time. And this book was called Life Begins at 40. So it's kind of cute because Capone's over here like, well, I'm stuck here, you know, for a few years, but I'm not even 40 yet. All right, when I get out of here, life begins at 40. 40 is the new 20. That's what I tell myself, at least. Warden Johnston even allowed Capone to start a prison band with some other inmates, and they were allowed to practice for 20 minutes a day. Capone started by playing the banjo, but he would later move on to the mandala, and when notorious outlaw Machine Gun Kelly arrived, he played the drums in Capone's band. It's like an SNL skit, kind of, right? I can just see Machine Gun Kelly back there, like, banging on the drums, and Capone's, you know, strumming his banjo, and it just seems like a hilarious picture in my head. But Capone loved music even before prison, and in prison, it was sort of like a saving grace for him. And music can be that and is that for many people, including myself. In a letter to his son, Al Capone boasted that he had learned to play 500 songs. And he told his son there was not a song written that he couldn't play, even though that doesn't make sense. Because if you learned how to play 500 songs, there's more than 500 songs in existence. So there's definitely a song written that you that you couldn't play because you only learned how to play 500 songs, but <laughs> details. And Capone even wrote a song for his wife called Madonna Mia. But there were other inmates who, as Roy Gardner put it, were looking for a no-rap way to take Capone out, maybe because he didn't invite them to be in his prison band. And so Capone was constantly getting into fights to defend himself. And one time he spent eight days in an isolation cell in D-Block after another inmate stabbed him with a pair of scissors. And Capone was only able to defend himself with the closest weapon he could find, which happened to be his mandala, which he grabbed and then used as like a, a club or a bat to, like, beat off his attacker. If there's one thing I've learned from researching this series, being in prison um, can give you some ingenuity, you know? Like, you will use whatever you got to do whatever you need to do. However, a year prior to entering Alcatraz, Al Capone had contracted syphilis, and his last few years at Alcatraz were marked by his deteriorating mental and physical state. Now, syphilis, if you don't know, it's a bacterial infection that plagued one out of 10 Americans in the 1930s, a decade before the discovery of penicillin, which we now know will kick that case of syphilis right out. But back then, they didn't have anything. Well, they, they did. They, they did treat it. They had um, like experimental treatments because, you know, this syphilis has been around since like the 14th century, I think. You know, so it's been around a while. And back in the day, they would like use mercury injections, which, ugh. Maybe I would take the syphilis over the mercury, but no, probably not, because syphilis, untreated, bad news bears. The illness progresses in three stages. The first is usually the appearance of a small sore or multiple sores, and this usually happens at the site where the bacteria entered the body, and within a few weeks, 
those original sores, which were usually painless and sometimes completely missed by the person who had been exposed, they would heal and the person would move on into the second stage, which is characterized by a rash that spreads to the entire body, even the palms of your hands. Now, if treatment does not occur at this point, the disease moves into the latent stage where there's no symptoms and a person can remain in this stage for months or even years before the third and final stage hits, the stage that Al Capone transitioned into while he was at Alcatraz. Because while the syphilis was latent, while you didn't see any outward signs that you were sick, inside the body, the syphilis is raging through, attacking important organs, specifically the liver, the heart, and the brain. These are important things that we need. Liver, heart, brain. We need them to be in peak performance, usually. And Capone's brain, man, got hit hard with the syphilis. He was all of a sudden known to become unpredictable, to morph from a completely normal, nice guy, a model prisoner, into a re- Aging maniac with no warning. Sometimes guards would walk by his heated cell and see him sitting inside, bundled up in his winter coat and gloves, staring off into the distance, wearing a strange and vacant smile on his face. Now, prison doctors injected Capone with malaria, which at that time was another experimental treatment for syphilis. But this treatment almost killed him, weakening him further and likely making his condition worse. During his last few years at Alcatraz, Capone spent more time in the infirmary than his cell. And in 1938, he was transferred to Terminal Island Prison in Southern California before being released a year later, at which point he moved to Miami, where he died in 1947, just a few weeks after his 48th birthday. Another of one of the most interesting prisoners to inhabit the cells of Alcatraz was Robert Stroud, better known as the Birdman of Alcatraz. Now, he was originally born in Seattle, Washington, and he ran away from home when he was 13, reportedly escaping an abusive father, although he continued to have a close relationship with his mother, who would try to help him throughout his entire life. When he was 18, Stroud found himself in Juneau, Alaska, where he became a pimp, and this led to the brutal murder of a bartender at his hands in 1911, after the man refused to pay one of Stroud's girls. For this murder, Stroud was sent to McNeil Island, and there he continued his violent behavior towards fellow inmates, guards, prison workers, nurses, everyone. This caused him to be transferred to Leavenworth, where he then stabbed a guard to death in front of, like, everybody. And all this guard did was say, like, no, your brother can't visit you today. And Robert Stroud was like, ch-ch-ch. After this, Stroud was placed in permanent solitary confinement, as he posed a risk to basically every living person around him. But although he was in solitude, he was not alone, because he began making friends with birds after finding a sparrow's nest with baby birds in it that had fallen when he was in the recreation yard. He brought the baby birds into his cell, he took care of them, and this sparked a lifelong interest in birds. And the prison ended up giving Stroud permission to have canaries brought to him by visitors. And at one point, Robert Stroud had 300 canaries living in an adjoining cell to his own in cigar boxes. And so Robert Stroud, he loves birds, he's taking care of birds, he's got birds, he's studying them, he's figuring out like what makes them sick, and he's also coming up with like uh, basically ointments and medicines to make them healthy again. After reading everything about birds that he could get his hands on and studying his own birds, Stroud went on to write and illustrate two books of his own, Diseases of Canaries, published in 1933, and Stroud's Digest on the Diseases of Birds in 1943. But sadly, when Stroud was transferred to Alcatraz in 1942, he was not allowed to bring his birds. But to this day, he's still considered to be one of the most knowledgeable individuals in the field of avian medicine. See, this is what happens when you don't have cell phones and you only have books. You learn shit. You get a skill. You contribute to the world even if you're a maniac in solitary confinement. And the kind of ironic thing is he's known as the Birdman of Alcatraz, but he didn't have any birds on Alcatraz. They wouldn't let him have them there. So it was kind of one of those things where you call somebody a nickname that they are not, like a six-foot-five guy. You'd call him, like, Tiny John, you know, or, like, a four-foot-four guy. You'd call him, like, Big Tim, you know, stuff like that, which is kind of sad. He didn't have birds ever again. 
Other notable prisoners of Alcatraz were Machine Gun Kelly, a few members of the Ma Barker gang, Floyd Hamilton, who if you watch my Bonnie and Clyde series, you know who he is. He spent some time on the road with Bonnie and Clyde. Whitey Balger was also there. We're going to get back to a couple of these people later because they come into the theories portion. But a total of 1,545 prisoners spent time at Alcatraz, the federal prison. Eight prisoners were murdered by other inmates. Five took their own lives. Fifteen died from illnesses. A number of them went insane. And almost all of them were plagued by a dark, bottomless sense of hopelessness. Roy Gardner arrived at Alcatraz when he was 50 years old. And Roy Gardner is a very interesting and textured person. He was known to be incredibly handsome, very charming, surprisingly intelligent. And he had gathered many nicknames over the years, such as King of the Escape Artist and the last great American train robber. He had a long and illustrious career of daring robberies and even more daring prison breaks. And by the time he arrived at Alcatraz, he was considered to be the most hunted man in Pacific Coast history, even though you really never hear about him, right? You hear about Bonnie and Clyde, you hear about Machine Gun Kelly, you don't hear about Roy Gardner. After he was released from Alcatraz, he wrote an autobiography called Halcatraz. And because he was such a good writer, he was able to describe the prison and the psychologically devastating impact that it had on a person as only someone who had lived there could. And his words give us some insight on why someone would dare to face the dangerous waters of San Francisco Bay in order to be free at any cost. He said, quote, The easiest way to get a clear mental picture of Alcatraz is to imagine a large tomb situated on a small island and inhabited by corpses who still have the ability to walk and talk. In other words, a mausoleum holding the living dead. The phrase, the living dead, is in no way an exaggeration because 75% of the men incarcerated on Alcatraz are doomed to die there, and they know it. The system on Alcatraz changes desperate public enemies into listless, lifeless automen, walking around apparently waiting for death to release them and not caring how soon it comes. The breaking of desperate men on the rock is all mental. There is no brutality or physical violence practiced or permitted by the prison officials. However, the mental torture is much worse than any physical torture could possibly be. Of course, it is necessary if society is to be protected to break public enemies such as gangsters and snatchers. And the system on Alcatraz is surely clicking 100%. 75% of the prisoners there know they will never again experience the rapture of a woman's kiss. They will never again shake the hand of a true friend, never again enjoy an hour of freedom. During the first year of imprisonment, they spend many sleepless hours looking at the ceiling and wondering, who is kissing her now? Some of them go raving mad and awaken the entire cell block with their insane screams. Others suffer in silence, and the only indication of their suffering is their bloodshot eyes in the morning. An indescribable something prevails on Alcatraz that is not felt in any other prison. It seems to be a mixture of hopelessness, hatred, self-pity, and cowardice. Most of the long-timers lose hope after about a year and begin feeling sorry for themselves. The next step is to become suspicious of his fellow prisoner, and then hatred develops. When he gets to that stage, he usually sits off by himself and broods, always blaming others for his troubles. If you remind him that he himself is responsible for his trouble, you are liable to have a fight with him because he is usually ready to back up his argument with his fists. Of course, the men confined there can expect no sympathy from society because 90% of them are habitual criminals and probably 50% are murderers. That type of criminal has forfeited all claims to be considered by society and theoretically dug his own grave. He would have been much better off had he committed suicide and let others dig his grave, end quote. Now, Roy Gardner himself was never the same after his time at Alcatraz, and on the evening of January 10th, 1940, he placed a note on the outside of the door of a San Francisco hotel room he was living in. The note said, do not open door, poison gas, call police. He then locked himself inside that room and dropped cyanide into a glass of acid, taking his own life by inhaling the toxic fumes the cocktail produced. Between 1936 and 1962, there were several escape attempts, but we are here to talk about Clarence Anglin, John Anglin, and Frank Morris. And after these three men escaped, the prison officials at Alcatraz, 
the FBI, and the media, they put no respect on their names. There were a few people in particular, um, Olin Blackwell, who was Alcatraz's warden at the time, and then an FBI agent who was a past warden at Alcatraz. They were specifically condescending and disrespectful towards the England brothers, and they constantly made it seem like these guys were just idiot backwater kids from the South who didn't know their ass from their elbow. But the way these men pulled off this jailbreak was beyond brilliant, amazingly impressive, and it clearly took an incredible amount of planning, foresight, and intelligence. Now, John and Clarence Anglin, they were brothers. They belonged to a large family of 14 siblings who were financially and otherwise down on their luck. And the brothers spent much of their youth in the tiny and impoverished communities of South Georgia before moving to Ruskin in central Florida. Though they had many brothers and sisters, John and Clarence, who were a year apart in age, they were best friends, and they were inseparable for basically their entire lives. From the young ages of 8 and 9 years old, John and Clarence began shoplifting from stores, and they were sent to many reform schools, but they managed to get away each time. One of their other brothers would later say that no building could hold John and Clarence. By the time they were teenagers, the brothers were regularly robbing, closed businesses, and they would eventually graduate to banks. On January 22, 1958, John and Clarence, their older brother Alfred, Alfred's wife Janet Anglin, and John's girlfriend Fern Taylor were all arrested in Hamilton, Ohio after the FBI got a tip that these bandits who were responsible for a bank robbery in Alabama five days earlier were hiding out there. The Anglin brothers had held up the Bank of Columbia using a toy gun, and they'd made off with $22,000, more money than any of them had ever believed they'd see in their lifetimes. Now, when they were taken into custody, most of that $22,000 was recovered from the Anglin's motel room and their vehicle, and all three brothers were given 15 to 20-year prison sentences. Alfred Anglin, Clarence and John's older brother, was sent to the Atlanta Penitentiary, and Clarence and John ended up in Leavenworth. During their time at the Kansas prison, both brothers repeatedly tried to run from the chain gangs, and they were finally sent to Alcatraz when John tried to smuggle his brother Clarence out of the prison into bread boxes. When their plot was discovered, John was shipped off to the Rock in the fall of 1960, and his brother followed him there shortly after. Living family members of the England brothers are still heavily invested in keeping their memory alive, and they strongly believe that John and Clarence made it out of Alcatraz and survived for a long time afterwards. David Widener, who's the son of Marie Anglin, John and Clarence's sister, he said, quote, My uncles were not bad guys. They were just desperate. Even when they robbed the bank, they used a toy gun. And when one of the bank officials fainted, they made sure he had water and was okay before leaving. But because no prison has ever been able to hold them, they were moved to Alcatraz, end quote. When they arrived at Alcatraz, the brothers became friendly with two other inmates, Frank Lee Morris, who was serving a 14-year sentence for an Atlanta bank robbery and had been in Alcatraz since January of 1960, and Alan Clayton West, a man who had been in and out of solitary confinement since his arrival to the prison in the summer of 1958. And they already knew Morris and West from other prisons, so they kind of reconnected at Alcatraz. And when the Anglin brothers were transferred to Alcatraz, the warden at Leavenworth had warned Orrin Blackwell, the Alcatraz warden, that the two men were trouble. And they were even more trouble when they were together. So he suggested that Blackwell, you know, keep the brothers separated. But John and Clarence were given side-by-side -side cells on the lower tier of B Block, which was the federal prison custom at the time to allow siblings to reside in cells next to each other, which I think is really nice. Also in side-by-side -side cells in B Block were Alan West and Frank Morris, just four cells away from the Anglin brothers, close enough to communicate between guard checks, which during the day happened every 15 minutes and at night happened once an hour. Now, Frank Morris, the third man who escaped from Alcatraz, he has a really sad backstory, actually. He was born in New Orleans to parents who abandoned him on the streets at the age of 11. He was shuffled in and out of orphanages and foster homes for the next two years before he turned to a life of crime at the age of 13. 
Now, throughout his teenage years, Frank Morris was arrested for crimes ranging from narcotics possession to armed robbery. And when he escaped from the Louisiana State Penitentiary while serving 10 years for bank robbery, he was recaptured and then sent to Alcatraz. But Frank Morris was naturally very intelligent with an IQ of 133. Now, the IQ scores of most people are, you know, an average between 85 and 115, with only 2 percent of the population scoring higher than 132. The higher your IQ, the better your reasoning and problem-solving abilities are. And Frank Morris would put his high IQ and these problem-solving abilities to the test to do what many consider to be the impossible. The Anglin brothers, Frank Morris and Alan West, began planning their grand prison break in the spring of 1961. On the evening of June 12, 1962, after their dinners, the inmates at Alcatraz were herded into their cells and locked in at 5 p.m., as they were every other night. And like every other night, the lights in the cell blocks went out at 9.30 p.m. At that time, prison guards walked past each cell, and John Anglin, Clarence Anglin, Frank Morris, and Alan West were all snugly tucked into their beds, illuminated by the dim light from the corridor. And all through the night, the four men remained in their beds as the guards passed by, doing their nightly checks once an hour. But the next morning at 7.15 a.m., when the inmates all got up, got out of bed, and stood in front of their cells waiting for the doors to open for breakfast, only one of the four men was still in his cell, and that was Alan West. The other three were gone, and no one could figure out how they had done it. It's so interesting and kind of hysterical reading newspaper articles that were printed in you know the days and weeks and months after this escape because the headlines shout things like, they said it couldn't be done, and break is first for island prison if successful. And through these articles, you can watch as they put it all together, this unbelievable feat that allegedly had never been done before, even though that wasn't true at all. In fact, Theodore Cole and Ralph Coe had managed to make it out of the prison and into the bay in 1937, and they were declared dead, but their bodies were never found. And we know that those four guys got out of Alcatraz when it was a military prison, and they ended up in that creepy forest. But the papers made a really big deal of playing up the whole, like, oh, they broke out of the fortress, oh, they did the impossible kind of thing. As soon as it was discovered that three prisoners were on the loose, the alarm was sounded. And guards began running all over the rocky shores of Alcatraz, thinking that there was no way these inmates had actually gone into the water of the bay. Now, previous inmates had managed to get out of the prison before, including Floyd Hamilton, but he was found later hiding out in one of the many caves that dotted the Alcatraz beach. However, no sign of the Anglin brothers or Frank Morris was found on the beaches, in the caves, in the tunnels, nothing. The Coast Guard sent out helicopters and boats to comb through the bay. The California Highway Patrol stopped and checked every vehicle going over the uh, San Francisco and Golden Gate Bridges in case the inmates had reached the shore and stolen a car. And the Oakland Tribune said, quote, in the event that the Anglin brothers and Morris tried to swim ashore, they faced the chilling prospect of swift ocean rushing tidal currents, 57-degree water temperature, and the possibility of sharks, which often come into the bay from the Pacific, end quote. However, the escaped inmates had not needed to swim to shore. They'd been more innovative than that. They had planned better than that. The genius plan allegedly began when Alan West, who held a prison job as a janitor, was sweeping the top of the cell houses, and he noticed a large ventilation shaft in the ceiling that led to the roof. So for some context, or to like kind of get an idea of what I mean, you've got the cell blocks and all these cells in the cell blocks, but the cells don't go all the way to the ceiling, right? There's three tiers of cells, and then they stop, so there's a space between the ceiling and the top of the cell houses. And, you know, West would have to go up there and sweep and dust and, and do renovations and paint and things like that. So as he's up there, he sees this ventilation shaft in the ceiling. It's a big one. And he's like, oh, this ventilation shaft, it must lead to the roof. 
West also knew that behind the cells of B Block, there was a rarely used utility corridor. And if someone was able to get out of their cell and get into that utility corridor, they could then use this large network and maze of pipes that were back there as a ladder to climb all the way to the top of the cell house, where they could then use the ventilation shaft to get out and onto the roof of Alcatraz prison. But in order to do that, the Anglin brothers, Frank Morris, and Alan West would need to squeeze through the very small floor vents that were located at the back of their cells, the back of every cell. And that was going to be tough since those vents were only a few inches high and a few inches wide. And they were surrounded by concrete that was 13 inches thick. However, the prison at this time was not in the best condition. It was old, the cell walls were eroding, and the metal fixtures were rusted and weak. And Alan West, as the janitor, had kind of already noticed this. So the first step was to remove the metal cover on the vent in their cells, and then they would work slowly and steadily, chipping away at the wall around the exposed vent hole to make it large enough for a grown man to squeeze into. The inmates accomplished this in a very ingenious way, using whatever implements they could get their hands on, such as smuggled spoons and knives from the cafeteria. Although I don't know how they got those out of the cafeteria, because they got metal detectors, but maybe the metal detectors weren't working. Like I said, this prison was very expensive to keep up. There was a lot of renovations that needed to be done, but there just wasn't the money to do that. So maybe the metal detectors were malfunctioning or they hadn't been working in a while, but they just didn't have the money to fix it. These prisoners even constructed a drill from the motor of a vacuum cleaner to help them get the job done quicker. And obviously, they're going to have to keep this ever-growing hole hidden from the prying eyes of guards. So they literally took a cardboard and they painted the cardboard to look like a vent cover. They made it look like a vent cover. It's insane. And this cardboard, this fake vent cover, would be placed over the hole in the wall during the day or during guard checks so that no one would catch wind of what was going on. Now, obviously, this work is going to be very loud and it might draw attention, but the prisoners were able to hide the sounds of their wall digging by doing their work during the hour after dinner when all the inmates were allowed to practice their musical instruments in their cells. And luckily, at that time, the prison was doing construction on A Block, and they were using jackhammers and other loud tools to knock down a wall in A Block to create the prison records room. And this also provided a nice cover for the England brothers and their friends. The inmates also created a makeshift handmade periscope with like a cardboard box and a mirror so that they could work while keeping a lookout for guard checks at the same time. But as I said, these prisoners were not planning to jump into the bay and start swimming for shore. They were going to make sure that they had a flotation device of some kind, a vessel of some kind, so that they could get from Alcatraz to the shore. And in order to build a raft, they turned to the prison library, where they read a November 1960 issue of Popular Mechanics that taught them how to create a makeshift inflatable raft and life jackets using old raincoats. So they smuggled dozens of World War II era raincoats from the prison, and they sewed the rubber parts of these raincoats together to form a raft and some uh, inflatable life vests that they would inflate on the night of their escape. And this is so cool. So they actually inflated this raft on the night that they were going to escape by using a musical instrument called a concertina, which is an instrument that's very similar to an accordion and it consists of expanding and contracting bellows so they were able to use it to blow air into this makeshift raft. They also constructed paddles out of wood and you might ask how the hell did they build what would have had to have been a pretty large raft six by 14 feet to be exact while they were hanging out in their tiny cells subject to guard checks at any moment. Well, they didn't build the raft in their cells. They built it on top of cell block B. So Alan West, like I said, he's the prison janitor. He told the guards and the warden of Alcatraz that he was doing some painting and cleaning on top of the cell house. And the paint he was using and all the dust from, you know, sweeping and whatever projects he was doing up there, it was continually falling down and onto and into the cells below. So he suggested that he should hang a bunch of blankets so that any dust or dirt or paint would be blocked from getting off the top of the cell house 
to the cells in the floor below. But what these blankets actually did was block anyone who was down below on the ground from seeing what was truly happening on the top of the cell house, which was these prisoners making a raft and life jackets and all sorts of things. And once the inmates had widened the hole in their cells enough so that they could squeeze through, they did in fact regularly squeeze through almost on a nightly basis and they crawled up the pipes in the utility corridor to the top of the cell house where they sat for hours sewing raincoats into a raft for two months. And for this raft, they not only sewed everything together, but they used hot steam pipes that were in the prison and glue from the prison to melt the rubber and the glue together into seams. But you might now be asking, how did they leave their cells for such an extended period of time when the prison guards are performing regular checks even at night? Well, this is the best part. The inmates used soap, toilet paper, and concrete dust from the holes they were digging around the vents in their cell, and they created paper mache dummy heads. Or if you're fancy, papier mache dummy heads. They painted these dummy heads to look like their own heads. And Clarence Anglin, who was working in the prison barber shop at the time, he smuggled out real human hair cut from the heads of prisoners that could be glued to the dummy heads to make them look even more realistic. In the days after their escape, one San Francisco paper said, quote, in their beds, accepted all night long as fast asleep convicts, were amazingly lifelike dummies with soap and plaster heads and pillow bodies, end quote. So they just put Put these heads on their pillows. These heads fooled the many guards who strolled by the cells throughout the night, and the inmates were left free and clear to work all through the night on their projects for months. But they did not do this alone. FBI reports state that at least half of the prisoners at Alcatraz not only knew about this escape plan, but helped the four men carry out their plan by smuggling them many tools and items that they needed. You know, more than 50 raincoats had been stolen and gathered by helpful prisoners and other inmates. And one inmate, Whitey Thompson, he claims he was the one who showed Frank Morris how to mix paint colors to create realistic flesh tones. And another inmate, Charlie Hopkins, said, quote, That's what a good inmate does. He helps another inmate any way he can. Whether you want to go or not, if you can help him, you help him, end quote. And this spirit of camaraderie is going to come back into play later on. So everything was set. Everything was ready. The holes in their cells were wide enough to fit through. They had their raft and the life jackets stored on the prison roof ready for them. They had their escape route planned through the utility corridor behind their cells to the top of the cell house, through the ventilation shaft to the roof of the prison. But for some reason on the night of their escape, only three men made it out of their cells and to the roof. Reportedly, Alan West, he was unable to fit into his cell hole that night. He hadn't dug the hole wide enough by the time they were ready to escape. And Alan West was not one of the men who was up on the top of the cell block making the raincoats and the raft and stuff. I guess he felt he did his part. He was kind of like the guy who got all the information. He hung the blankets. You know, he was helpful in other ways, but he was not up there sewing rafts together and things. So he just didn't know that his hole wasn't wide enough by the time they were ready to escape. Escape. And as it actually turns out, the inmates had made two rafts, the large one that they took with them and a smaller one that they left behind on the roof of the prison along with one of the life jackets. And it's speculated that Frank Morris and the Anglin brothers got up to the top of the roof, um, the roof of Alcatraz, and Alan West didn't make it and they kind of waited for a little while and then they were like, well, we can't wait anymore. Like, we've got to go. So we're going to leave this little raft here for him and his life jacket and hopefully, you know, he makes it. But at this point, it's every man for himself. So Alan West was the only one of these four men to be found the next morning in his cell. And he was there to let the prison officials know all the details of their carefully laid plans. Except it doesn't appear that he ever really explained what was meant to happen once the prisoners got onto the roof of Alcatraz and then used drain pipes to get to the ground below and then climbed the 12-foot fence topped with barbed wire, crossing the 100 yards to the beach, What were they going to do after that? Where were they going? Where were they headed? He didn't really give a ton of details on that. He said that they were planning to get to shore and then steal a car and take off. But footprints were discovered at the water's edge on Alcatraz facing Angel Island. And this led authorities to believe that the men put their raft into the water at this location. And if they did head for Angel Island, 
they may have shoved off again from Angel Island to nearby Tiburon. Two of the makeshift paddles that the England brothers and Frank Morris had made would be found later. One was found in the water around Alcatraz. The other was located on Angel Island, which is roughly two miles away from Alcatraz. One of the life vests created out of raincoats later washed up on Cronkite Beach north of Rodeo Lagoon. So from this Google Earth image, you can see little Alcatraz Island here, and then there is the much bigger Angel Island over here, and then Tiburon, where authorities believed the inmates were heading if they got to Angel Island. And then if you go further out towards the coast, you have the Marin Headlands, and on the coast, you have Rodeo Beach, which is the area where the life jacket would have been found on the other side of the Golden Gate Bridge heading out to the Pacific Ocean. A few days later, a watertight plastic bag was found floating in San Francisco Bay. And inside, there were, I believe, seven to nine scraps of paper found that reportedly had addresses written on them. Addresses of people that the three men were expecting to contact once they made it to shore. They also also found a photograph of Clarence Anglin in this bag and a prison bank receipt which bore the name of Clarence Anglin. And then, one by one, over the course of a few weeks, two more life jackets made from prison-issue raincoats appeared in San Francisco Bay. As I said, that first one was found beyond the Golden Gate Bridge, one was found just off the shore of Alcatraz Island, and one was found off the shore of Angel Island. Now, at the time of the prison break, the warden of Alcatraz Prison, Olin Blackwell, was vacationing at Lake Berryessa in Napa County. And when he heard about what had happened, he rushed back to the prison island to start doing damage control, along with other prison administrators and the federal government. And they were all like, no way, nah, there's no way these guys didn't drown. They didn't make it off the island. They didn't make it to safety. They definitely, like, drowned in the bay. Don't worry about it. Didn't we tell you about how cold the water is? Didn't we tell you about those raging, savage currents and the sharks? If they didn't just immediately turn to a block of ice when they touched the water, the great white sharks surely gobbled them right up. Now, I've mentioned the shark thing a few times now, how everyone was always talking about these great white sharks swimming into the bay from the Pacific Ocean and hanging out around Alcatraz waiting for some unlucky prisoner to try and make his escape. There's a lot of documentaries about Alcatraz out there. There's a lot of books written about Alcatraz out there. And there's a lot of people who have extensively studied this area, this island, and this specific prison break. You'll hear different things about the whole shark thing. Some people say, what sharks? There are no sharks in San Francisco Bay. That was just propaganda to scare the prisoners so they wouldn't try to escape. And for the most part, I'm pretty much on board with that. But I also don't want to pretend as if there's never been a shark in San Francisco Bay, because that would also be an inaccurate representation of the facts. In reality, there are about 11 species of sharks that can be found in the bay, but these aren't really man-eating sharks. You know, they're mainly bottom feeders and sharks who enter the bay to have their babies before going back to the Pacific Ocean. And as far as great white sharks, the bay actually does sit in the middle of what is called the Red Triangle. And the Red Triangle reportedly starts at Bodega Bay, extends out past the Farallon Islands, and down to Monterey Bay. And in this area, around 40% of the country's great white shark attacks have taken place. However, these great whites, they rarely enter the bay. And although a few great white sharks have been spotted near Alcatraz Island over the years, there's never been a shark attack in the bay. So based on all of that, yes, I think the rampant stories about waters teeming with sharks who would just bite you and eat you whole, they were completely put out as propaganda and scare tactics. But that doesn't mean that venturing out into the bay at night on a raft made of raincoats wouldn't still be scary and somewhat dangerous. A newspaper at the time who wrote about the escape wrote, quote, being on your own in the middle of San Francisco Bay on a foggy night with a fast tide lapping at you, water about 54 degrees numbing you, must be a nerve-wracking thing, a frightening thing. Perhaps the most frightening thing is the fact that you wouldn't be able to see much. If the fog is in, the Golden Gate Bridge to the west would be blotted out, as would the Oakland Bridge to the east. The lighthouse would be blanketed and fog horns would moan all around you, end quote.
But I will say this, San Francisco is foggy. The Bay gets very foggy. But it, it appears that these three inmates, the England brothers and Frank Morris, they may have used the fogginess factor to their advantage. Because remember, there's like four guard posts on Alcatraz. So if you were just like kicking off in a raft, you'd probably expect that one of these four guard posts or the guards in them would see you. But if it's super foggy, then the visibility would be lower and they wouldn't see you. So you wouldn't have great visibility either, but at least you wouldn't be spotted and and be literally dead in the water. And I do know for a fact that the summer months in San Francisco, which are the warmest, they are also the foggiest, June through August. And the foggiest month of the year is June. So they may have picked June specifically because of the fog factor. After the escape, government and prison officials began giving information about the the three escaped inmates to the papers. And the Asbury Park Press said, quote, who thought up the escape from Alcatraz is unclear, but it's apparent that the mastermind of the break two weeks ago by three Southern bank robbers was Frank Lee Morris, a small man with the large IQ of 132. End quote. Fred T. Wilkinson, the assistant director of the FBI, who had known all three men when he'd been the warden of Alcatraz previously, he's the one that talks mad junk about them. He said that Morris was very quiet and intelligent and, quote, he is not given to rash violence. Above all, he's a planner. The whole operation seems typical for him, end quote. But the Anglin brothers, on the other hand, he described them as natively cunning and throwbacks to the swamp country throwbacks to the swamp country, he said that they were more given to action. They were more the criminal element type. He basically told the papers that the England brothers were losers who were never going to be any good, had never been any good, and he didn't think that they could have come up with this escape on their own, which I believe is probably true, but they were cognizant enough to bring somebody in like Frank Morris, who was smart enough to help them figure out this really genius escape. And in a way, isn't that smart in itself? Like when you can't do something, you find somebody who can. When you have certain strengths and certain weaknesses, you team up with somebody whose strengths are your weaknesses. That's kind of smart. The Bridgeport Sunday Post asked the question, quote, did Frank Morris and the Anglin brothers succeed where a score of bitter, hardened inmates before them had failed? No, says the FBI and most of the other authorities involved in the two-week search for the three Dixie bank robbers, end quote. Alcatraz authorities and the FBI insisted that the three inmates had headed to Angel Island and drowned in their attempt, citing the evidence of that plastic bag with the addresses in it, which had been found floating in the bay, with one official saying the men would never have parted with those addresses if they were still alive. This same official went on to say, quote, even if they had a board or something, it would be too much for three non-athletic types for all their planning to overcome the challenge of the bay, a challenge on which the fame of Alcatraz is built. End quote. Man, they're still going with it, right? These inmates literally bounced off the island. You guys didn't even know about it for hours, but you're over here still like, Alcatraz, you can't break out of it. It's famous for being impossible to break out of. Fred Wilkinson, the FBI agent and former Alcatraz warden, he added to this saying, quote, it would take an athlete to make such a swim. The only swimming these fellows were accustomed to was in the little old creeks in the swamps of Florida and Louisiana, end quote. So condescending, man. Like, how does he know what kind of swimming they did in their lives? How does he know? These are grown men. They could have been Olympic swimmers. You don't know. So condescending. These guys just pulled off something truly brilliant, something that took a ton of planning and smarts, something that you said couldn't be done. And this dude's talking about them like they're stupid little boys. I'm offended. But the fact was, after three weeks of searching and not finding any sign of the three men, dead or alive, people were starting to wonder if Alcatraz was actually as escape-proof as they had been led to believe. Frank Price, who was the FBI agent in charge of the San Francisco area, he told the media that he was just wondering when their bodies were going to turn up. He was like, we're just waiting for the bodies to pop up, to, you know, come up from the bay. That's what everyone's waiting for. But Dr. Henry Turkle, a San Francisco coroner who had investigated hundreds of deaths in the bay, he claimed that it could take anywhere from a day to three weeks for the bodies to resurface. And since that time frame had come and gone, he doubted that they had drowned in the bay. And he said, quote, it is barely possible, but highly improbable 
that the three bodies could remain submerged for more than three weeks, end quote. It's funny how he said that because you think he would say it's like it's highly improbable but possible that they could come up. But he tricked us there when he used that but. He said it's barely possible but highly improbable instead of saying it's barely possible and highly improbable. Very strange. And even though the FBI was saying that these men had drowned on their way to Angel Island, San Francisco's swimming coach, Earl Ganek, felt that they could have easily made the swim. He said, quote, And if they had any kind of raft, they could have ditched it on Angel Island and then swam easily from there to Tiburon, end quote. Three days after the England brothers and Frank Morris made their daring escape, Earl Ganek conducted an experiment with two people who were not trained swimmers or in shape athletes, a 28-year-old salesman and a 25-year-old insurance agent, and both swam from Alcatraz to Angel Island in roughly 53 minutes. So I like that because Earl probably saw what they were saying, you know, about like, oh, they're not like swimmers. They're not athletic. And he was like, challenge accepted, you know, and Earl admitted, yeah, the water's cold, but it wasn't that cold. And he said, quote, the convicts might have accustomed themselves to cold water by taking cold showers whenever they had the opportunity in prison, end quote. And Ted Walters, a former Alcatraz inmate who had tried to escape in 1946, he told the papers that he had prepared for his swim in exactly that same manner, saying, quote, I took ice cold showers twice a day for four months to get in condition for the swim, end quote. Now, Walters did admit that the water in the bay became so cold to him that he was grateful when he was caught and the Coast Guard finally plucked him out. But he didn't have a raft, and the England brothers and Frank Morris did. Also, a California patrolman who wished to remain anonymous during his interview with the media, he believed that the escaped prisoners must have had help from outside people, saying, quote, I think that if they were smart enough to get off Alcatraz, they must have had some kind of plan, end quote. I agree. This patrolman also put forth the theory that someone with a boat had been waiting for the escaped inmates somewhere on Angel Island. And the FBI said this theory was ridiculous. They were like, that's ludicrous. None of these three men had friends or family who had the money or the resources to travel to San Francisco and pay thousands of dollars to put a boat in the bay every night waiting for the night of the escape. But that's a lot of assuming. That's a lot of conjecture happening on behalf of the FBI. What else is new? They're assuming they know everyone that the England brothers and Frank Morris knew. You know, it's not just family and friends. These men were like criminals. You know, they hung with the criminal crowd. So they may have known somebody from their time robbing banks and stuff who would have the means to, you know, get a boat and wait for them. But the FBI is also assuming that there was no specifically planned night for this escape, that with all the careful planning these four prisoners did leading up to their escape, they just decided on the night of June 12th, 1962, like, it's time to go. All right. I mean, what night is better than tonight? We didn't like tonight's dinner. We're done. We're not eating another meal here. We're out. Obviously, they're going to have a specific night planned for this, right? And if they had help from the outside, they would have had some way of getting a message to this person or people on the outside to let them know one night they were going to be escaping. They wouldn't just expect their friends to just go and sit in the bay every night and wait for them to just come paddling up on their raft made of raincoats. Come on. Additionally, on the same night as the prison break, an off-duty San Francisco policeman named Robert Chechi was parked at Marina Green, and he was sitting in his car, and he's just kind of gazing out at the bay. He said it was just before midnight when he noticed a pristine white boat idling in the water near the St. Francis Yacht Club. Chechi felt that something was off about what he was seeing because it's late. The boat seemed to be on, but the lights of the boat were off. And as he watched, he did see a light suddenly go on, and he saw that someone in the boat was shining a flashlight into the water. The boat began moving out into the bay, and the port and the starboard lights did turn on at that point. He couldn't tell what direction the boat was heading in, but he said he watched it disappear into the dark. What if there was people in that boat with flashlights shining the flashlights, maybe when they heard some paddling, so that Frank Morris and the Anglin brothers could see them through the fog and know which direction to paddle towards. 
And you can see from this picture, the area where Chechi was parked at Marina Green is on the same side as the St. Francis Yacht Club. So he would have been able to kind of have an idea of what was happening. But through the fog, he may not have been able to see if anybody else arrived or if anybody was on the boat. In fact, he said he couldn't really tell if there was people on the boat. The only reason he knew there was people on the boat was because of that flashlight. Now, the next day, Officer Chechi heard about this prison break. So he goes to work because he works at the police station and he tells everybody about what happened and he filed a report. And he claims after that he was contacted by the FBI and he was questioned for days. And he said their demeanor was very rude, you know, abrupt and nasty. Years later, Chechi told ABC7 that the FBI asked him over and over and over again, what did you see? Where was it? What time was it? Why didn't you swim out there to see what was going on with the boat? <laughs> and then Chechi claims that one FBI agent said to him, quote, like, hey, let's just make this go away. Let's bury it, end quote. Now, it kind of sounds like a conspiracy theory. I'll give you that. You, you might be asking yourself, why would an FBI agent say something like that to a witness? Well, there could be many reasons. First of all, this is the 1960s, all right? Um, things were different back then. Nobody was as politically correct and aware that they could be, you know, canceled or exposed at any point. So they talked a little bit more freely. Secondly, Chechi was a police officer technically an officer of the law. So the FBI agents may have viewed him as somebody that was kind of like on their level, on the same team even, and who would be willing to kind of go along with their plan. And there is some evidence to back up what Officer Chechi saw that night. And we're going to get there. After the escape, wanted posters were put up all around the Bay Area, in post offices, convenience stores, government buildings, everywhere. And this led to the newspaper, the Dothan Eagle, to speculate that the FBI wouldn't be spending their time and their money and resources printing up a bunch of posters for three men they claimed were absolutely, beyond a shadow of a doubt, drowned and dead. And the Oakland Tribune reported that FBI agent Frank Price, special agent in charge of San Francisco, he'd admitted that all United States attaches in Central and South America had been alerted to be on the watch for the escaped convicts. And I completely agree that it's definitely shady. Like, you read these newspapers for weeks, for like a full-ass month. The FBI is in there saying like, no way. They did not make it off. They did not make it off. We would have seen something by now. We would have had, you know, a vehicle reported stolen. We would have had, you know, some of their clothes turn up because they would have had to have changed. We would see some sign that they'd made it to shore. We would have sightings of them and things. They definitely are dead. They're gone. Don't worry. Nobody worry. They didn't make it off. Why are you putting posters up then? Why are you putting posters up if you are absolutely 100% sure that they died as you made it seem that you were? And if the FBI was so sure that the three escaped prisoners were dead and gone, they sure had a funny way of showing it as they began an in-depth investigation into the three men, which included placing the families of John and Clarence Anglin under surveillance and following up on reported sightings of the brothers and Frank Morris. And as it turns out, there may have been a valid reason to do so, because according to the Anglin family, in the years after the Alcatraz escape, John and Clarence's mother would receive flowers on her birthday with no card to say who they had come from. And it also seemed that Albert, the older brother of John and Clarence, he may have had some inside information about what had become of his brothers. And this information may have led or contributed to Alfred's untimely death just weeks before he was paroled from prison. And that is where we're going to pick up in the third and final installment of this series. Thank you so much for being here with me. I really appreciate it. I hope you're enjoying this series and the story as much as I am. Don't forget to check out links in the description box for Surfshark VPN, for my social media, Twitter and Instagram, for my podcast, Crime Weekly, that I co-host every week with retired police detective Derek Lavasser, and also a link where you can check out and purchase my coffee, which is Criminal Coffee Company. We have three different roasts. They're all delicious. My favorite happens to be Alias. Uh, she's the dark roast. She's real dark, real deep, not bitter at all. Great flavor profile. So check that out all in the description box. I will be back very soon with the final part of this series. And until then, stay kind, stay beautiful, and stay safe. Bye. Bye.